Well, good morning. Uh, I was wondering if maybe uh, we could just start out with a, a little bit of, of confession today, some public confession. Uh, any, anyone else in the room like me and you're a warrior? A warrior? Uh, I didn't say warrior. I'd like to be a warrior, but I I'm, I'm lean more on the warrior side of, of things. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there is no shortage of things for us to be worried about. When we look out across the landscape of what's happening in the world right now, uh, we're in an election year and there's political agendas and we look at global unrest, we look at inflation, uh, sometimes we look at the stock market, it can be a little uh, wonky, if you will. Uh, you, you look at the culture and what's happening and, and we have a lot of people who I would just say are rebellious against God and even his people. There's uh, violence, and so we have all of these kinds of things, and, and we look, try to look out over the horizon, and we wonder, okay, is there going to be like a, a revolution or a civil war? And all of these things just kind of weigh heavy on our hearts, and when, when our minds are kind of stuck there, and we, we have our head down, and we're looking at all of these things that are going on, we can forget how things are really meant to be, how life is to be lived. And so when we're focused on ourselves and our own issues that we have, or on the world and the issues that are in the world, we end up with fear and stress and worry and anxiety and even panic attacks. And if you find yourself in a position like that right now, or maybe in the past, you're not alone. Uh, I've had my own fair share of emotional kind of roller coasters and worries and stress, and much of it has been self-inflicted. Much, much of those things happen by my own sinful worry and my own sinful fears that I, I have on the inside of me. Some of it, some of it has been oppressive from the enemy. And I know that some of you here in our congregation have experienced those kinds of things yourself. And so when I look at my life, so I'll just talk for me, when I look at my life and I see that I have anxiety and fear and worry, the, the question really is, do I just not trust God? Do, do I not believe what he said? The question for me is, am I ignorant of who God is? Or do I just not trust him? And so for me, when I get in those seasons, I always have to come back and and turn to God's word. I have to consciously think about verses, or I have to remember God's faithfulness in the past. I have to remind myself of verses like Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So I have to have a little bit of self-talk that happens. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then I have to remember, okay, what benefits? What benefits are there in, in remembering our God? Well, it is God who forgives all your iniquity. God who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. It, it is God who forgives. It is God who heals. It is God who redeems. It is God who crowns with love and mercy. It is God who satisfies us with good things. That's what I have to remind myself of, that my Father God is in heaven. And all of these things that I'm worried about and consumed about, I need to turn my attention not down on the world or in on my feelings, but up toward God and who he is, and what he is doing. And when you think about it, for those of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ, we have God, our Father, caring for us, seeing us, and not just that, indwelling us, having the Spirit of God himself on the inside. And when you think about you know, where we're at, we live here in the United States. I mean, even if you're not a Christian, you're blessed. We, we live in one of the most comfortable times, most comfortable places anywhere ever. And despite all of that comfort, we're among one of the most angst-ridden cultures that has ever been. And so we, we try to find ways of coping 
And so we try to find, like, okay, I'm going to have to, like, do some deep breathing exercises. We medicate. We self-medicate. We, we, we look for escapism, someplace to get distracted with all the things that we've got going on around us. We, we look to do stress management. And then Jesus comes along, and he says, I don't want to teach you how to manage your stress. I want to eliminate it. Jesus says, I want to get rid of your stress and your anxiety and your worry. So here, here's what I want us to, to know today. Here's what I want us to walk out of here with. I, I would love for us to understand that living in the kingdom of God with an eye on what's to come provides anxiety-free living. Living in the kingdom of God with an eye on the future provides us with anxiety-free living. When you enter into the kingdom of God, you're a son or daughter of the king, and he cares for you. And in order to understand all of that, you need to know the purposes of God and the promises of God. But when you're in the kingdom and you have an eye on what is to come, it provides anxiety for your living. Now, that's a mouthful. So I thought I'd break it down and try to make it bite-sized so that I could remember it. And so this is the way that I remember it. Don't worry, be ready. Don't worry, be ready. Notice it's not don't worry, be happy. I'm not concerned about happy. I don't even think that God's concerned about happy. And we can get into a conversation like that sometime. Don't worry. Be ready. And you'll understand as we, we talk about this, as we talk about what the Lord Jesus would have us to know from this passage that we're reading in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 22. That what we're about to read is as true for us in 2024 as it was to the first century Christians when they heard Jesus say this and then read this written by Luke. Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 22. And Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. So I think we can see clearly in the first century, in a, in a third world kind of country, their, their concern was, am I going to have enough to eat? Are we going to have food today? It, it, do I have something to wear? Now we still ask, what am I going to eat? But we're standing in front of a stocked pantry. We ask, what, what are we going to eat while we're in front of a row of restaurants? We ask, what am I going to eat in front of the buffet? We still ask, you know, what am I going to wear? as we're staring into a closet full of clothes, and then we say, I have nothing to wear. <laughs> what Jesus is saying here is, you exist for a higher purpose. That, that your life isn't just consumed with the day-to-day -day food and clothing and all those worries. Life isn't about food and fashion. God brought you into his kingdom on purpose. He, he brought you here for a purpose, and that purpose would be to, to fulfill his glory in your life and in this world for the rest of eternity. And so when you enter into the kingdom of God through his son, Jesus Christ, God is your father. You're a son or daughter of the king. And your purpose is for his glory. And since you are here for his kingdom, now and into the future, he's going to make sure as a son or daughter, you have everything you need. That you're not going to have to worry about food and clothing. That's not your first concern. God will always take care of these things for us. He's gonna take care of all of our needs, not just, not our wants, because life is more than food and fashion. It's more than wishes and wants. It is about the kingdom of God and the care of God for you, his child. Pick it back up, verse 24. Jesus says this, consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. So that kind of puts this little visual image in our head of these little you know, raven farmers, right? Little ravens with bib overalls driving John Deere tractors and little straw sticking out the side of their beak. And he's saying they're not worried. They're not stressed out. Like, is the crop going to come in? I'm not quite sure. He says, consider these birds. And yet God feeds them of how much more, how much more value are you than the birds. So Jesus says, look out, look, look around you, L lift your head up. Look at all of creation. God is the one who made it. God has made everything in creation. 
And he is the one who sustains it. All life is from God. And God will take care of what he has created. And, and this isn't just something like, well, that's a nice idea. Like, this is a, a philosophical kind of thought. No, this is reality. This is our maker caring for our needs. And, and some of you in the room, you've seen this. You've seen God take care of you. Now, we live in a world, like I said before, where we're first world, we have all of these things that are disposable. But some of you have had experiences where you can say, no, I've seen the hand of God at work to provide. For instance, when, when uh, my mom and dad started out in ministry in the early 70s, they weren't paid much. We, we didn't have much money. In fact, we were poor. Uh, we didn't have extra savings in the bank. Uh, we didn't have extra clothes. And there, sometimes there wasn't m money for food. And so mom and dad would literally pray for food. And then anonymously, a bag of groceries would show up on the step. I remember mom talking about one time uh, about a miraculous bag of flour. She had one of those small bags of flour, and it was half full. And she was worried, right, because they didn't have enough money to get to the store to get any groceries. But she felt impressed by the Holy Spirit that if, if she would trust him and not look in that bag that he would continue to provide. And mom said that she dipped into that small half bag of flour for eight months. Now eventually it stopped because you can imagine the temptation to peak. So she peaked at one point. And it was shortly thereafter that flour ran out. But for those of us who have come to this place where we realize I, I only have God to depend upon. I'm not depending upon me and my kingdom and my smarts and my ability. It is only the Lord who's going to have to come through, many of us in this room would say that God is faithful, that God cares for his creation, and that he loves us. So Jesus says, don't worry. Don't worry. Life is more than food. It's more than clothing. Then verse 25, he says this, in which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life Worrying isn't going to add a single span to your life. Some translations translate this uh, verse this way. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his height, of which I can testify? I've, I've, I've tried. Like, Lord, please, a little taller would be nice. The, the bottom line here is worrying isn't going to change your circumstances. Being anxious doesn't change that. He says, if then you're not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? I'm not going to add one day to my life by being anxious. My, my days are determined by God. I, I can't add to that. In fact, worrying, worrying ends up maybe even shortening your life because it causes high blood pressure. And for a worrier, that makes me worry even more. <laughs> like, stop worrying, right? It's like, ah, oh, stop it. So it's this vicious cycle. So then he says this, consider the lilies. We've already considered the birds. Now consider the flowers, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And again, when we think about this, when we think about this, this doesn't really hit home because we've got lots and lots of clothes. How many clothes do we need? I mean, if you've got one to wash, one to wear, and one to mend, you have more clothes than you need. And yet our culture kind of conditions us to say, well, you don't have enough. You're going to need more. And it's always a matter of perspective. And it seems that's the way many times in my own life, the worry that I create, the worry that's a matter of perspective, and I'm not seeing it from God's eyes. Jesus goes on. He says, and do not seek what you were to eat and what you were to drink, nor be worried. Don't worry. It's a command. Don't worry. Commanded by God. Now, I realize this is easier said than done, and I'm, I'm trying to be as honest as I can about my own life so, so that maybe if you're in the room and you're in a similar situation as, as me and you end up worrying and having fear and anxiety, I want you to know, I realize, it's not as easy as just simply saying, well, stop it. But I do want to provide you with some tools. And so we're going we're gonna to do a little sermon within a sermon. So I've got three points here. They're not going to be on the screen. 
But if you're somebody who's in the midst of worrying and you're anxious about this life, you might want to jot these things down as a reminder. How, how do we overcome? How can we begin to move in the direction of not worrying? Number one, take every thought captive. Take every thought captive. And your scripture verse for this is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, where it tells us that we are to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Now, notice I'm not asking you to take every feeling captive because your feelings are fickle, your feelings are phony, and they will lead you astray. It is not about your feelings. It is about your thinking. And so many times your thinking affects your feelings. So don't move in the direction of feelings. I know you've heard preachers talk about that a lot here recently, uh, about how we feel and what we might uh, feel like doing. That can get you in a world of trouble. So over and over, Scripture begins to remind us that we have a battle that's going on in our mind. And so you begin to take every thought captive. What is repeating and replaying in your head? That's an outright lie. You take it captive, you make it obedient to Jesus Christ. And that may take a bit of time. I mean, it, it could. But be aware and take those thoughts captive. Second thing is this. Lean into your heavenly father. Lean into your relationship with him. Jesus has already talked about this in Luke chapter 11. When, when we read through the Lord's Prayer, when we talk about our father, we're going to see our father mentioned in verse 30 and verse 32. But I would encourage you to develop that relationship with an understanding that God sees you and you know that there is a God that is aware of you in the moment, that you would trust him, that you would lean on him in the middle of your worries and your fears and your anxieties, that maybe even perhaps you would look at the letter that he has written to you, his word, and you would find some things that he has given to you as his child and maybe commit it to memory. Hold it in your heart. Just in some seasons in my life where I've wrestled and wrestled and wrestled, Psalm 91 was it such an important psalm for me in that season, in that moment. In fact, I had to repeat it to myself just verse 1 this, this last week where I just simply said, God, I'm reminded, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. God, I want to I be in your presence. I'm going to abide in you. I have this worry. I have this anxiety right now, but I want to be in your presence. Maybe you want to commit to memory something like First uh, Peter, First uh, Peter chapter 5. Verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And you just hold that in your mind and your heart. And when that anxiety comes once again, God, I'm going to cast all of this anxiety on you because you care for me. God, this weight, it is far too heavy for me to carry right now. So I'm going to put this in your hands. I'm going to lay it down at the foot of the cross again. I know I picked it up, but I'm going to leave it here for you. And I will take your yoke, which is easy. And Lord, I know and I can trust that you have this. It's yours now. So what are we doing? We're going to take every thought captive because it's starting. Your thoughts begin to shape the direction of your heart and your mind and your life. We're going to lean on our Heavenly Father. And then finally, we're going to pray until we get peace. Pray until you get peace. And so if you are filled with anxiety, pray until you get peace. Our verse here is Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Let me read that to you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We're going to take every thought captive. We're going to lean on the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, and we're going to pray, and we're going to pray until we get peace. Jesus goes on. He says, don't, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, all of those things. Don't worry. For all the nations, verse 30, for all the nations of the world seek after these things. And your Father, your Father knows. He knows that you need them. So we know this God. We know who he has revealed himself to be. We see it within the pages of Scripture. We know that this is the God who has created all things, the entire cosmos. And all resources are at his disposal. And he is all-knowing. He sees all things. And we can entrust our one to the, to the one who owns everything and the one who sees us. He sees us when we're awake. He sees us in this room right now. When you go home this evening and you go to bed tonight while you are asleep, your heavenly Father sees you and you are in his hand. He sees you. He knows you. And that's a comforting thing to know, know that he knows our needs so Jesus then says this, instead, 
Instead of seeking your kingdom and all these different things that you're worried about, like food and clothing, instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things, they'll be added unto you. Don't worry about your kingdom and what you're going to do and how you're going to manage and protect all of your stuff. You begin to worry about the kingdom of God because God sees you and God cares. God will take care of you. Do you remember singing that hymn, some of you growing up, God Will Take Care of You? That hymn was written in 1904 by a, a pastor's wife, Sevilla Martin. If you've never heard that hymn before, it goes like this, the first stanza. Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. The second stanza. Through days of toil, when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast. God will take care of you. And the chorus, the refrain, God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you. This is the promise. This is who our God is. This is the one who made you, the one who loves you, the one who sees you. God is aware. Do not be worried. Do not be afraid. Seek his kingdom first. What if we took all the energy? I'm preaching to myself. What if we took all the energy that we put into worry and anxiety and playing out scenarios into the future, and we instead poured that energy into our faith. We poured that into trust in our Heavenly Father. I believe that would change everything. I believe the weight of the world that's on your shoulders and mine would quickly go away. Jesus says this, verse 32, fear not, it's a command, the words do not fear, do not be afraid, fear not occur hundreds of times in Scripture, and they are all a command. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give it to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. And the next verse, verse 34 this is the hinge point. This is the connection. This is the point that Jesus is getting to. This is, if you will, it's a bit simplistic, the solution. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is, this is a, one of those verses that we often talk about with our finances, right, in our giving. So many of you here, you're faithful in your giving. And for those of us in this room, who, who may have this tension where we worry and we worry about our finances and what's to come, you know that that tension is released when you give. When you keep holding on and you're holding everything tight and you believe it's all yours and you're responsible for everything, man, it just, it's like this balloon that's about to burst. But then when we begin to give, it begins to let that tension out and we're reminded once again, I'm not the owner of this. I'm the steward of these things. And, and it's not just money that, that we treasure, is it? We don't just treasure money. We treasure things. We treasure people. We treasure experiences. But what Jesus is saying, if you would take all that stuff that you consider to be yours, and you no longer feel that you're the owner but a steward of those things, and you would place it back into the hands of your heavenly Father who owns all of it anyway, what you will find is peace. What begins to happen in your life when you realize, okay, Everything I own is God's. Like that, that vehicle that I have that I'm so worried about, like I'm, I'm worried about it breaking down, I'm worried about somebody else smashing into it, and, and then somebody actually does hit you and, and your car is all wrecked, well, then you simply say, God, someone wrecked your car. <laughs> it's not mine. I'm stewarding this thing. You, you saved up for the expensive carpet and the small group, the life group comes over and somebody spills grape juice. You're like, well, that's God's carpet. Somebody spilled juice on your carpet, Lord. This is yours. This property is yours. My family's yours. The bank account is yours. It's all 
yours. And when we let go of holding all of those things, there's a peace that enters into our lives where your treasure is, friend. There will be your heart. There's a kingdom. There is a kingdom offered. And it comes at the expense of abandoning everything that this world has to offer into the hands of Jesus Christ. When he says sell your possessions and give it to the poor, let me just tell you, he's not telling you to sell everything and then you become poor so somebody has to sell all of their things to give to you. He's saying this, don't let your possessions possess you. If it does, just get rid of all of it because it's not yours. The Christian life is not you adding Jesus to your life. It's about you abandoning everything into his hands. It's about what we've already read in Luke 9, verse 23, that, that we would deny ourselves and take up our cross daily, that we would be living in his kingdom, that we would be concerned about his kingdom rather than our own kingdom. Friend, this is where the worries and the anxieties and the stress begin to cease because there's a different kingdom that we realize. Don't worry. Be ready. Don't worry about all of the stress and all of the things and all of the possessions because here's the truth. All of our possessions, we're leaving behind. Everything you own. Everything in your bank account, your property, your home, you're leaving it behind. And the Lord Jesus Christ is returning. And when Jesus returns, he's coming with that kingdom that we have been investing in. As good stewards, there is a possession for us. He is our bridegroom. He's coming with a dowry. That dowry is his kingdom. It's an amazing thing. We don't need to worry about what's happening globally right now and just be stressed and worried. He is returning. Jesus is coming back. And when we have this realization, it begins to lift our hearts. So now Jesus begins to speak about being ready for the kingdom to come. His point is don't worry, be ready. These things aren't separate. He wasn't trying to like say this thing over here, don't be worrying. Oh, let me talk about the future when I'm coming back. Don't worry, I'm coming back. Be ready. This is what he says. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for their master. The word master here is curios. It's Lord to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. So the master of the house, he's gone out and he's at a wedding. All right, And they don't know back home where he's got servants when he's coming back, but they want to be ready for him. This is saying, Christian, you need to be ready because Jesus Christ is returning. Friends, he promised. Yes, he died on the cross. Yes, he rose from the grave, but he said, I will return. I'm coming back for my bride, and I'm going to set up my kingdom on earth. And he's going to rule and reign in person here. And those of us who are sons and daughters of the king, we will reign with him. And we have to be ready because Jesus is going to return. Don't worry. Be ready. He says, blessed are those servants. Doulos is the Greek word. Blessed are those servants whom the master, the Lord, finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. Well, this is crazy. So instead of the master coming home and telling the servants, get me something to eat, the master, the Lord, is going to wrap an apron around, and he is going to serve his servants. So in Christ's faithfulness, he is then going to serve his faithful ones a meal. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. I've got it covered, Jesus would say. If he comes in the second watch, so in the, the, the Jewish system, the way that they would separate the, the watches of the night, this would be 9 p.m. to midnight, the second watch. If he comes in the second watch, or in the third watch, midnight to 3 a.m., and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. Christian, don't worry, be ready. Look up. Christ is going to return. He's going to bring a kingdom with him. Some of us, maybe, would actually be alive when that happens. Some of us may pass away, we'll be with him, and we'll meet you when we get back. But know this, that if the master of the house, all right, the word master here isn't, isn't curios. This, this is actually a, a word related to servant. So this is the, the head servant of the home. 
But know this, that if the head servant had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man, Jesus is referring to himself, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. So you don't know when Jesus is going to return. We've kind of been on our toes, looking over our shoulders, paying attention to this kind of thing. It's just a reminder in every generation that we've got to be on our guard. We can't let our guard down, and we can't just simply be involved in the things of this world and leaning into our flesh and going in the a direction of a world that is lost. So we've got to be prepared, and we've got to be watchful. Now, we can know seasons, and we can look at certain seasons and be like, oh, boy, I think it might be around the corner. We've got to be ready. Now, Peter says this. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? He's kind of confused. Is this just for the 12, or is this going to be for all disciples? And this is for all disciples. And the reason that I say that is because Peter got it, because in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, he says, be aware, be ready, the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Jesus is coming back, and this is for all. And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master, the Lord, will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master, the Lord, will find so doing when he comes. So Jesus is looking for faithful people who are investing and involved in not just their kingdom, but his kingdom. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. So he's looking at what we do now with the things that God has put into our hands. This is a picture of faithful stewardship. This is a picture of the rewards that end up happening in heaven. And I have no idea how all of that works, what it looks like for those of us who are faithful in serving God and the kind of rewards that we'll get and whether or not we want to keep those or we just throw them back at the feet of Jesus. Not quite sure, but there's, there's levels of rewards. Now watch this. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the males and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. So Jesus now mentions a foolish steward. Who says, this is an arrogant steward. The arrogant steward is the one who says, you know what? My master's been a long time in coming. In fact, it's been 2,000 years since he said he was coming back. So I'm going to live however I want to live. Maybe I'll have a little bit of time to get my life right later. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. This is a clear picture of somebody who is not a true believer. They would like to look like one. And when the Lord returns, it's not going to be a matter of conversation, just swift judgment. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. So, so this is somebody who didn't really distance himself from the master, might have even looked like some of the other servants. This is a reminder that, that you, you can't have saving faith and act like an unfaithful steward. You, you can pretend to have saving faith, but be unconverted. And so Jesus offers this sober warning here. That kind of person who doesn't have a relationship with him, they're going to be counted among the unbelievers, and not only that, their judgment is going to be worse. People who hear God's word, who hear the good news of the gospel, and they continually suppress it and they want nothing to do with it, they're in far worse condition than others. Watch this. Jesus then says, but the one who did not know. So the first one knew, but was arrogant. This is the one who does not know. They're ignorant, not arrogant. They don't know. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. So we have one person over here who's going to receive a severe beating and one person over here who's going to get a light beating, which reminds us, just as there are rewards in heaven, there are different levels of punishment in hell. And you can, you can find that kind of spelled out by Jesus in other passages like uh, Matthew 10, 15, Matthew eleven twenty two, 22, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Now, again, don't know how all of that looks. But here, here the, the one who is arrogant who pretends to be a believer, not a believer, more, more in the realm of hypocrisy, will receive a severe beating and deep punishment. And the one who is arrogant or, uh, ignorant of it is the one who's going to receive a less severe beating. Now, 
Be, being ignorant isn't an excuse. Being ignorant of the gospel and who God is, that's not an excuse because we realize in Romans chapter 2 that there is no one without excuse. Romans chapter 1, God has revealed himself to all mankind through his creation, through his commandments, and through the conscience that he has placed on the inside of us. So none of us are without excuse to know that there is a God who has a desire and plan for our lives. So he goes on here, the, the one who didn't know uh, did what deserved a beating, will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Friend, this, this is Jesus. This isn't like a pastor preaching this. This is Jesus lovingly expressing to his people that they need to make sure that they're truly his. Do you truly belong to him? Are you a child of the king? Are you in his kingdom? Can you appropriate the purposes and promises of God? And this is Jesus, once again, extending an opportunity to live in his kingdom or to live in your kingdom. And in his kingdom is peace and life and riches. But in our own kingdom, all we end up with is fear and worry and anxiety. Remember all those things I talked about at the beginning of the message? All those things that we can be worried about that's going on in the world and the culture right now? Think, think about your heaviest worry, your deepest concern right now. I just want to remind you, that's temporary. All of it's passing. I believe that Jesus would have us be more concerned about his kingdom than our own kingdom. That we would not worry but we would be ready because of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is coming back. Let's be found faithful and obedient. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you for the salvation that he provides, the new life that we have in him. And while we are here and we are flesh and we experience just the temptations of this world and the difficulties and the challenges, we're thankful too that you know how we are formed. You know where we are weak, but you have not abandoned us. You have not left us alone. You have provided an opportunity to know you through your son, Jesus Christ, and to experience life, not just in the future, but life abundant now. And for all my friends in the room right now who have been consumed with worry, that just around the corner is anxiousness, I pray, Father, that in its place you would provide a peace that passes understanding, we lift our eyes to you and we trust you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.